afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back uh, to number two. Good to see people have come back to it. It's always a positive sign. Hope you've had a good week and had a great Patrick's weekend. This week, this time last week, we were looking forward to a nice day off early tomorrow and so on. Unfortunately, we now have to pay the piper and get back into the the the, the nitty gritty of things until was well, it two weeks time? We have um, Easter. Okay. Today we're moving on and we're going to start breaking down resourcing in the project team. We're going to be looking at we've chat a little chat about the importance of um cross-functional teams in a project. We're also we're looking at a model that's used in um uh, the, the, the in a project, in the, the running of a project. And it's it's called the Tuckman model, which is also known as the forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning model. Um, so we're going to work through those to start with. Um, the talk, we'll work through the Tuckman model to start with. Now, we'll, as we go, we'll talk about the, the, the cross-functionality and we'll talk about the actual, the teams themselves. So projects will always start with initiation, the forming side. It's where, in my view, a lot of people can um a lot of projects can be made or broken on how it's set up if you have a a situation and i've seen this happen unfortunately where just you just grab a group of people and stick them in a room and say right you're on a project that doesn't work we need to get people, the right people into it. a project is, as we discussed last week, it's a very specific process. There's a very specific focus on this. We want to achieve something specific. So we need to put the right people in play so that we can achieve what we're trying to, what we're setting out to achieve. As part of that, at the forming stage, the initiation stage of a project, this is kind of where we can start getting people together and we can start getting around the table and trashing out the, the ideas, the process, the scope. We can discuss the budget. We can discuss all the, the, the constraints we talked about last week, including the time. We can talk about all, all the things we mentioned last week. We can start pushing forward to say, well, what, do we, what are we trying to do here? Is this something that we can do? Is this feasible? Are we, are we biting off more than we can chew? Do we need to reformat this? Do we need to break it down and maybe take smaller steps with it? So this is where we start to have this initial conversation. We need to start getting the core team together for this. Who are the main people? Within any sort of a project, Having cross-functional involvement is important. Cross-functional and cross-level involvement. We can't just randomly grab people. We need to make sure we have the right people. And we need multiple expertise in most projects. You might need somebody involved in purchasing. You might need somebody who's good at, at logistics. You might need somebody who's good at quality, somebody who's, who's expert at, at, at uh, production. You need the expertise around the table, depending on what you're trying to do. You can't have people there who are just going to guess about doing these things. I'm sure it, it, it'll be all right on the night. It won't. If you want it to run efficiently, we need to bring the expertise on the table and recognize that these people bring expertise to the table, encourage involvement, encourage their participation, encourage their contribution. Because that is what we need. We need this multifaceted environment. Equally, the people who are at these meetings need to realize that the hierarchy changes. I remember telling a CEO at one stage um, who was 
she was going to sit in on a on a project meeting and I, I met her at one stage and she'd gone into one of these meetings and she said it was very quiet. Everybody just sat there. There was nobody talking. There was nobody doing anything. I said, where did you sit at the meeting? And she said, well, I sat in my normal seat at the top of the table, top of the boardroom table. I said, well, there's your answer. I said, you were still, you were there. You went in and you took charge. You sat there in charge. You took the throne. So I said, next time, I asked when the next meeting was going to be. And there was another meeting scheduled to see if they could get a project moving. So I said, okay, next time you go to a meeting, I want you to go in. You're the CEO. Fine. You own the business. They're your employees. Great. But it's not your project. So when you go to the meeting the next time, I want you to sit somewhere else. Do not sit at the top table, at the top of the table. Sit somewhere else. Position yourself somewhere else. And all you are allowed to do is listen and take notes. You are not allowed to challenge or in any way dispute or instruct anything. Let the meeting happen. In that project, you are not in charge. You have a project manager. You have someone there. You have decided you want them to run it. Let them run it. It was hard for her. She admitted. I met her after the meeting and I asked how she got on. Or she rang me after the meeting. She said it was difficult. She was or she she wanted to say things and do things. And but as the meeting went on and people got the confidence to know that she's not going to challenge everything we say, stuff got done. The project moved forward. So there is a change in the hierarchy in some cases. Some manage in some situations, you get a CEO taking personal responsibility for something and they want to be involved in it and they want to be in there. Great. But we have to, part of this forming process is we have to remember that the project team is made up of several experts, several people who know what they're doing. And we got to give them the rein to do that. You've got, you know, if you're, I, I always bring it back to building a house. If you're building a house, you've got the people who are experts at the block work. You've got the carpenters and the roofers who are expert at that. You've got the people expert at plumbing, people who are experts at plastering or at electrical work or things like that, foundations work. There are people experts at different parts of the process. We have to let them be the expert in these processes. When do I need them in? And what do I need them to do? And then if they say, well, that's not feasible, you know, instead of we have to do it this way, it's why is it not feasible and what can we, what would you suggest instead? What else can we do? How can we make this happen? What alternatives are available? The forming stage is getting the right tools in the box working out and clarifying exactly what we're trying to do. Last week, I talked about the three constraints where we had the, the time, the scope, and the cost. Those three items are formalized at this stage of the process. They're formalized at the forming stage because this is where we decide what are we doing in this project? How long do we need to do it? What specifically are we trying to do? And how much are we willing to pay for it? What's the budget? This is where we set the foundation. If you don't have the solid foundation, you can't build the walls. And any other pl any plan beyond that, if we don't get this stage, the initiation stage right. Um, in other words, you put the right team on the pitch, and you have the right you have the trashed out exactly what you're trying to do. Then, it's not going to happen. At the moment, I'm I'm fielding emails from students in another college, 
who were preparing to start a dissertation journey over the summer months. And I'm bouncing emails back. I'd make Rafael Nadal lose a match because of him. I'm returning the serve. Um, because people are going too broad and they're too vague for their project. Research is a project. And it's just going back to them. Sorry, you need, you're too vague on this. It's too broad. You're not going to get this. It's not going to matter. It's not going to work. You're going to get yourself stuck. You need to find fine tune it, zone in, specifically tell me what you're trying to do here. It's the same in any project, whether it's a business project to achieve great more sales, whether it's a new product or a new service being developed, whether it's a house extension, and whether it's a holiday plan for the summer. We need to make sure we have the right people talking about the right things and we know the scope of, and the budget and the timing of what we're trying to do. So there's a lot, lot of disagreements possibly in this this is where a lot of the agendas can get put on the table and all of a sudden get wiped out because people will come to these meetings with an agenda of, oh, I want this covered and I want that covered and I want the other thing done. Um, this is where we kind of get the uniformity, in this forming piece. We're getting the people around the table who are starting to realize why. If we've chosen correctly, then people around the table will want to be around the table. They know why they're there. I remember one time being called to a meeting, being, being literally just getting an email from the managing director, be in the boardroom at two o'clock on, let's say, Thursday. That was it. That was the sum total of the discussion, of the email. Um, so I turned up for two o'clock into the boardroom, not knowing what sort of trouble I was in at that point, because that sounded very ominous. And I turned up and I got went into the boardroom before two o'clock and there was a lot of other people standing around in the boardroom. Every one of us had gotten the same email. Every one of us was there kind of, do you know what this is about? No, I didn't have a clue. And you're noticing people from different departments. So it's not even a uniformity in... You know, why we're all like it wasn't all I was part of supply chain, so it wasn't all supply chain was there. Um, there were people from qualities, there was people from production, there was people from planning, there was people from supply chain, there were people from across the board in in there. And two o'clock, the seat the, the managing director walked into the office with another person, took the seat at the top of the table. And basically told us, right, as of from this moment, you're on a project. And this is blah. And he is now your project manager. He is your boss for the next, for the foreseeable future. And after a very brief conversation, instructing us to clear out our offices and move our stuff to another room that had been designated for this, um, this, the managing director got up and walked out and said, I'll leave you to it. And we're all just, we were all, I remember we we're all just sitting there looking at each other going, what's this about? What, what project? What, who, what, where, which, when, moving where? Not the way to start things off. And as it turns out, the project was poorly planned in the first place and it just fizzled out after several months. After plenty of cost as well, because we end up doing different things. So this forming stage is important. It links to what we did last week, this getting the scope, the time, um, and the costings right. Or at least getting his best shot at this, because, yeah, things can change. It doesn't always pan the way we want it to go. Some things change. Circumstances change. The world changes. But we have to be as realistic as we possibly can. After we look at the this this initial forming stage, we move on. If I can get the computer to work, there we go, to stage two. And once we know what the project is all about, we now start to look at the, the plan. We now start to put some more meat on the bone, so to speak. So we start looking at 
double checking the goals, looking at goals within goals, looking at the goals, the the the, the quick, the low hanging fruit goals, the the easier things to achieve. We start moving forward with those. We start finalizing out on the scope because we've discussed it, we've trashed it out, we've zoned it in in the, in the forming part of the process. We've made sure we have the right people there. Now we're just going to flesh out everything, maybe develop our Gantt chart, our time chart, our flow chart for the project, all of the steps. And that can take time because if we are vague in the plan, it's going to slide. It's going to get out of control. And I, I've asked somebody at one stage, if we were to do a project plan to make a pot of tea, what would it be? And people will say, well, I'll boil the kettle and I'll put the put up the tea in the teapot and uh, put the hot water in and, you know, tea's made. But if you're to break it into a project, there's a lot more detail. A lot more detail is needed because every step has to be identified. What can happen when all the things are happening? Where is the overlap? Where is the, the tandem? Where is the stuff that's that's going to happen that has to happen before something else happens? And there is a much longer process. There's a much more detailed process that's required, which to some people looks like overkill. But if we want to get it done right, we want to avoid any sort of uncertainty and we want to avoid any sort of curveballs that might come at us because we didn't think about it. So to make the pot of tea, you've got to first get the kettle, you've got to take it to the tap, you've got to open the kettle, turn on the tap, you've got to fill it to the level of whatever the water level is, you've got to turn off the tap, you've got to close the, the kettle, bring it back to wherever the kettle is plugged in or put on the stove, you've got to plug it in, you've got to switch it on, you've then got to get the teapot, you may have to, as the kettle starts to boil, you may decide to put some hot water into the teapot to warm the teapot if you're being proper about it. In the meantime, you want to get out the cups, the saucers, the plates, the milk, the sugar, whatever you put into your tea. Plus, you might want to get out some biscuits or something to go with that. They all have to be got out and prepared or put on the table. Then you go back to the kettle, which is now boiled. You throw out the water you were warming the kettle with or the teapot with. You put in either your tea bag or if you're posh, your loose tea, and then you put the hot water in. You close the teapot, you close, you put back the kettle, you take the teapot to the table, you cover it maybe with a tea cozy again, if you're posh, and you wait for the required three minutes that the tea is supposed to draw, unless you're my wife, and you just wave the tea bag over the water, and then you pour it out. Um, there's this process involved. Certain things, like preparing the cups, the saucers, the milk, and the other stuff, can be done while the kettle is boiling. But other things like putting the water on the tea, on the tea bag or whatever, is not something you can do until the water has boiled. Water must be boiled, then you put it on the tea. So there are certain things that can be done in tandem. And there are certain things that cannot be done in tandem. And until you sit down and write, plan out the project correctly, who's doing what, when, where, why, and how. We have the right people around the table from the forming piece. We know the project, what the end game is from the forming piece. The planning piece is a lot more of the how. And that assigns the responsibility of the who, what, where, and when. So in order to achieve the goal of the project, within the time constraints, within the budget, and within the scope that we have decided for the project. This is now where we're seeing, how do we go about this? And what needs to happen first? So this is one of the hardest decisions to make, is what's the first step? What's the first thing we're going to do? Uh, you know, it's very often the first thing we're going to do is clear the site or 
make space for something or we can't even begin to build that until we've done this. We've got to do some research first. We've got to learn about what we're trying to do. You know, there's things like that that will impact and that change how we do things. So this storming stage where we're starting to allocate positions and people might, the storming bit comes a little bit from people kind of posturing or fighting for position. It's kind of the last trash of, I was called from my department to be part of this project. Um, where, you know, I have, I have a position. I, I do know I'm the department manager. Yeah, great. And for my department, you're doing this project. Yeah, fantastic. Brilliant. But for this, unless you're doing the project on your own, you're part of a team. And as part of a team, you are now going to be part of the team. You're welcome. Your contribution is valued. But it's a team. It's going to be a team effort. We're all in this together. Rank doesn't matter. We have an assigned project manager. That is the, the main rank. After that, it's duties. It's responsibilities. It's the who, what, where, when, and why. It's the person giving a, a responsibility and accountability to take on a particular particular task within the project and have it completed by a specific deadline. It doesn't matter if it's the CEO's asked to do it or an operator from a production line is asked to do it. In a project situation, the only hierarchy is project manager and the project team. That is, if you start putting in rank and pulling rank, nothing will happen. If people start getting noses out of joint because they haven't been given an important part in the in the game, it's not going to work. You know, look at the sport sports teams. I don't follow sports. I pretend I I pretend I know about them, but sure, we'll see how this one works out. You know, Ireland won the triple won the, the Grand Slam last year, last week, and the triple crown. Um, one of the things, and I I did not follow it. I'm a, I'm a jinx to this sport because every time I watch it, they lose. So I don't watch it now. Um, but what I did notice in one of the comments, just one comment, and I think it came from the Scotland match, the second last match. The Irish team got absolutely is a tough game, probably one of the toughest they had in the whole championship, and they got hammered in terms of injuries. And what stood out for me in the commentary I heard after was how players who played on different parts of the pitch took responsibility and moved. They became the person throwing the ball in the line out, something that doesn't happen. They had this cross functionality to be able to step in and take on the other role because the person who was supposed to be doing it was gone off injured. And I think it's why Ireland was successful on this occasion is because they had focused on Cross functionality on teams being have been cross functionality and succession planning, people being able to step into the role, but it wasn't the case of sorry, that's not my responsibility. It was what needs to be done. I'm doing it. I can do that. I'll do it. This is what a project team is all about. It's about this know what needs to be done and forget the. I'm the captain. I'm the manager. I'm the uh, I'm the the supervisor. I I that I shouldn't be doing that sort of job. When I'm running project management courses or project management classes for for the college, there's a group project that I would get them to do as one of the one of the assessments. And they basically one of the things that I get them to do in that is they have to rotate responsibilities. There's only four of them in the team. 
Um, but, but, but rotating responsibilities means that for some meetings, there's a person in there. It may have been the project may have been their idea. But for some of the meetings, their only job is to take the minutes and circulate the minutes. That's it. They're there to discuss things and be part of it. But their primary role at that occasion is not to chair the meeting. It's just to take the minutes. And it's not to do anything other than this practice in taking the job that needs to be done is important, is an important aspect of project planning. Stepping up to the task that needs to be done, focusing on the task at hand, not the position. It can be hard for some people to do that. A strong project manager will stop it. A strong project manager will say, no. In this project, the only person in charge is me and you're welcome, but you're part of the team. Emphasis on the word team, not part of the hierarchy. So it can be difficult. That's why it's storming because there's a little bit of posturing can go on here and a little bit of, it can be a little bit difficult. It can be a lot more negotiation happens at this level. Um, but at some point, we get past that. The plan is there. The process is mapped out. We know who's doing what, when, what they're expected to do. We know all the, all the information now. So at some point, the rubber has to hit the road. And we move to the next phase, which is called norming. And in the norming, this is the, where we start the project. We're starting to work through it. We're starting to bring the deliverables forward, We're starting to get things happening here. The Scrum system I talked about last week, by the way, those people who registered interest in it, you should have received... Um, the invitation to complete the the program um, as I sent them out the other day. Um, if you didn't, just contact Anya and we'll resend it to you just to make sure. You have 30 days to do it. I saw some people uh, yesterday, yesterday or yesterday this morning, I see some, I got e I get copied on emails when people are doing the tests and things just to let me know they're done. Um, and I got uh, an email from people who've already got it done. So it's, it is, you know, quite a quick process. If you get stuck into it, just give it a bit of time. So well done on that. But the whole thing of the, about executing this Scrum project is <clears throat> in is using what's called sprints, mini projects within the project. And that's what this execution is. It's getting at it, doing the making the project happen in the steps and the stages that have been mapped out using a Gantt chart, using a flow chart, just using a sheet of paper. Because when you map it out, <clears throat> this isn't rocket science. People overcomplicate these things. When you write it out, um, what you find is <clears throat> you get the question being asked, is this the order we should do it in? Is there anything which should happen before that happens? What needs to happen before that step? So we can start to move things around. Sometimes in a, in a project room, one of the great tools you can have is post-it notes, preferably different color, <clears throat> different color post-it notes. Because then what you can do is, you can take the post-it notes and you can, the wall is great because and post-it notes are safe. You can put them around and you can look at the order. You can look at the flow and then you can take it out. And you can, no, that doesn't need to go there. That needs to go back here. And you can move it around and play with it. Walt Disney, actually, many years, there's a story of Walt Disney. Uh, obviously, the man died in the 60s, so it's before then. Um, he had, in his studios, there was rooms where his animators used to work and the creators of all the cartoons used to work. And it was, it was a fairly big room, but it was a, you know, aged room at, that, at the, some point. And he decided one weekend when they all went home on, 
on Friday that he would bring painters in and they cleared the room and they completely revamped it, did it all up, painted all the walls, brightened it all up um, over the weekend. So that on Monday morning, when the animators came back to work, um, it was a bright, it was freshly painted, it was a clean room, you know, just, just a good looking room again. And that's grand. They went about their work. And he went back to them, I don't know, a couple of days, a week later. And he noticed a lot of holes in the wall, tiny little holes in the wall. And what it was, they didn't have post-it notes back then. And what it was, was the, the animators were using the wall to decide on the storyboard, the flow of the cartoons, the way things were going to happen. So they were taking their notes after writing them out or drawing their sketches and they were taking drawing pins, thumbtacks, and they were going to the wall and they were pinning them on the wall. And then they were taking it out from there and moving it somewhere else and juggling these around to make them all fit. And he hit the roof because he spent a fortune getting the office painted up. And here they are punching holes in the wall with thumbtacks. And what I did not uh, following weekend or a couple of weekends later was again on a Friday, everybody went home. We brought the guys back in, brought in the the engine, the, the worker, the all the engineers or whoever, the decorators, that's the word I'm looking for, brought in the decorators again. And this time they didn't paint the walls. They covered the wall, all four walls of the of the office in corkboard. And, right, guys, go nuts. And this is the thing. When we have the project mapped out, if it's done right, we know the order in which everything has to be done because at the planning stage, we have mapped it out. We have carefully sat down and we've had the discussions about, is there anything else? Is there, is there anything that should happen before that? Okay, so I'm putting the lid on the pot of tea. Did I ever put the water in the pot? Well, it's not, no, it's, we assume that. No, but did you actually say it anywhere? Is it written? Is it mentioned? Is it a part of the process? Yeah, it's assumption. We can, yeah, we can make the assumption you want to put hot water into the tea. But do we need to state it? You know, it's easy to say, well, we need sockets in the wall, double sockets in the wall of a house when we're building the house. That's taken, uh, with the exception of the bathroom, that's taken as an under, as understood. But do we decide where we're putting them? I mean, there's a building in, in the County Hall building in Cork. One of the, 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 it was the tallest building in Cork, in Ireland for a while. Um, it's on the Carragrahan Strait, or as the Amer as Dublin people call it, the Carragrahan Strait. Um, it's the county council offices. It's a skyscraper building. Um, they built that, and again, it was understood that it would be that they needed one or would be one. They put no post box in it. At the time, postal deliveries would have been on Saturdays as well as Monday to Friday, but the council offices didn't open on Saturdays. The building was closed on Saturdays. There's no post box. They forgot to put her in because it was assumed it would be there. It was just part of the process, but nobody actually wrote it down, so nobody actually put it there. So simple for things to, you know, fall apart. A simple oversight. So you want to execute the project. You want to get the project up and running. This is where we're starting to deliver on it. Then what we have is um, everyone having their tasks, knowing what they have to do, knowing when they have to do it, and getting on with the task. Because we take out the, the positioning or the, 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 the ego trip stuff, and we're now focused on the project, then things move a lot better. The project manager, as the manager, should not 
be engaged in the specific tasks. To be a project manager means you are coordinating it. You're observing it. You're making sure it is moving. You're there to troubleshoot. You're there to smooth the path that needs to be smooth, to deal with people or issues that are cropping up that need your attention. But you don't get stuck into individual tasks. Again, an example, when I was, I remember growing up on, on particularly on Saturday nights on TV, you'd get these variety shows. Um, things like the, the uh, Paul Daniels and these, these people put up these various variety shows, the live at the Olympia, the live at the Apollo type of things without the, just all the comedy acts. There are a lot of variety stuff, circus act type of stuff. And there used to be a, an act that I hated, but it was always somewhat mesmerizing. A person would come out and he would put a, you know, maybe a five foot bamboo cane into a, a kind of a mat on the floor, standing vertically. And then he'd sit a plate on top of it, a china plate on top of it, and he'd start spinning the plate on top of the bamboo cane. And when the plate is spinning, he'd go and he'd get another cane and stick it beside it and put another plate going, and then another and another and another. And as he kept building and adding a plate, adding a spinning plate, he was watching all the others. And as one plate, like the first one after a period of time, would start wobbling a little bit more violently, it's, it's slowing down, it's about to fall off the cane. So he'd run back and he'd give the cane a little shake and that would get the plate spinning again. And then he'd go back and he'd put another cane in, another plate, and he'd keep going with what he was doing. Why am I using that as an example of project management? A project manager is coordinating, making sure all of the aspects of the project, all the plates are spinning. And his attention or her attention only goes to the plate that's wobbling, that's have this kind of problem. And he goes back. And he gives that the support it needs to get it back up to speed. Doesn't touch any of the others. Doesn't even look at any of the others. They are doing what they're supposed to do. They're spinning happily on top of the cane. And it's only when they start to show signs of struggle that the manager gets involved, the, the performer gets involved and gives it a little bit of a, a, a nudge to keep it moving. And this is what something a project manager needs to be careful of. If you get sucked into it, you're not managing the project now. You're part of the team. Sometimes that's needed. Sometimes some projects will, will resource themselves a bit tighter and the project manager has to be part of it. And that makes their job harder because they're playing two roles. They're part of the team, but they're also the project manager. So they have their own tasks to do, but they're also in charge of the overall project. Realistically, in an ideal world, there should be two separate people. Because they have to liaise with the client, the person who the project is for. They have to liaise with suppliers they have to coordinate the overall like the conductor of an orchestra if anybody ever goes to a concert you never see the conductor running around playing all the instruments they're the ones who are making sure that the violins are playing the right thing and the the piano comes in when it's supposed to and the percussion comes in as they're supposed to and they all do what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it because the first thing a project manager realizes is they're the experts in their field. You know, a person playing a trumpet is the expert playing a trumpet. They're in the orchestra, therefore they must be bloody good at it. Or hopefully they're very good at it. A person playing the violin is good at the violin. Now, I have my plan, otherwise known as the sheet music score for this piece they're performing. And I just have to make sure that everyone's coming in where they're supposed to come in and they're sh stopping where they're supposed to stop. And we get through the process. We go through it. We hit the last note. We all, they all stand up. We all turn around. We all bow and the audience goes nuts. The execution involves that coordination. The, the, the project manager needs to be 
as much as possible away from the operation. If you get sucked in, if the, if the conductor of the orchestra has to sit down and play the violin, or actually even worse, sits down to play the viola, and I know it sounds like a very small thing, but just trying to get the positioning of where things are in the orchestra, the viola players generally have their back to everything else in the orchestra. They're, the, they're in front of the, of the conductor. The violins are to the side, so they can kind of look sideways up at the rest of the orchestra. But the, the, someone like the, viol, the viola player has their, or some of the other violin, the lesser level violin players, they have their back to the orchestra. So it's going to be very hard for them to do their bit and coordinate what everybody else is doing if they're trying to be the project manager and are sucked into the detail of having to provide the music of one of the instruments. Same in any other project. You keep yourself out of the out of it because you're managing the project. You are not the team. You're not working as one of the team. Because that brings to the next bit, part of the job of the, respons- of the responsibility of a project manager, and that is project monitoring. How's our performance? There's a mantra I learned too many years ago in, when I started studying business first, and it says, what gets measured gets done. If you know you are being assessed, if you know what you're doing is being checked and measured, well, it's human nature. You're going to put more attention into it to get it done. And this is where the project manager needs to be free from individual tasks because the project manager has to make sure that we are still on track, that we are moving forward. We're on budget. We're on the scope and we're on time. And if we're not, if we're slipping on any of those, well, we need to take steps to address that. This is where the management comes in. The project management comes in. Equally, as a project manager, I have to field calls from the client who may want to change their mind. And I have to manage that. If anybody's ever watched the Room to Improve or any of these grand design programs, there always seems to be somebody in the in the team or somebody who wants to move a door or change a window or put something different in the kitchen or something like that. There's always some changes without consideration as the knock-on effect that's going to have in the overall project. It needs the person to be able to step back and say, okay, you want that? Well, then one of the three constraints has to move. Either you're now changing, because you're changing the scope, the cost is going to change and or the time is going to change. You need to sign off on that if you want us to put that change in place. And that's where the project manager has to stand up and has to be assertive, somewhat tough about this because otherwise it's just going to drift. And if it starts to drift, it just won't ever be achieved. And what will happen is the client will get fed up of it and the the project team will get fed up of constant changes and they'll just leave. They'll walk away from this. What's the point? This is, should I come back in six months? You'll still be trying to make up your mind what you're going to do with this. So the monitoring is vital. If we're on track, happy days, keep going, make sure we stay on track. But it's a task that needs to happen. And for that, the project manager has to be available to do it. As we get to the end of the thing, we don't just get up and walk away. You know, it's not a case of, right, project's finishing tomorrow, it's Friday, and uh, that's it. Good luck, lads. They're an adjourning process. Every project is an opportunity to learn. Every project has to be formally wrapped up. We need people to come back and give us uh, feedback. We need to get people's feedback as to how they feel it went, what happened. We need to collect any documentation that exists, uh, invoices, the various project charts, minutes from team meetings, all of that information has to be gathered and formalized into a document. Because next time a project is happening, it can come out and become a learning as part of the storming area or the forming area way back when, we could actually use it to kind of say, okay, well, this is what we did the last time. Now we need to make sure we don't do that again. 
or that worked well the last time. Let's see if that works here. Or do we think that would work here? Instead of reinventing the wheel, you know, just are going to do the whole thing from scratch. There's things that might be learnable. We can't just get up and walk away. We've got to have that last meeting, the adjourning meeting. I also used to know that as the morning meeting because it's the sadness we're breaking up. We're all going back to our normal day lives. Um, it is important. Then after that's done and that, that, that report, that document is handed over, that is when the project is finished. In some cases, they finish with a bit of a social event, but only after all the formalities have been completed, all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. So within all of that, and I've covered some of this already, what does a project manager do? I just, I love to think of the project manager as the conductor, the orchestra conductor. Their job is to integrate all aspects of the project, ensure proper knowledge resources are available when and where they need them and ensure the expected results are produced in a cost-effective manner. I, as I say, I'd like to be visual about some of these things. I love thinking of uh, the orchestra. I love thinking of the conductor of an orchestra. You've got to make sure that the right instrument comes in at the right time, playing the right thing. Very often they've arranged the music at the start, so they've set it all up before the thing has even started. And making sure that the people that are there know what they're doing. The person who's on trumpets or trombones knows how to play a trombone, knows how to play a trumpet. Um, you know, that they're, they're not just messing with this or they're just not just playing with this. They're actually doing what they need to do. Um, and that is important. Uh, because that's their job. You don't see, as I say, you don't see them running to play the instruments. So selecting the team very quickly, I'm watching the time been selecting the team before we, we wrap, I've said we need different skills. We need cross-functionality. And that is crucial. We're not all experts at everything, but there are people out there who are good at certain things and other people are good at other things. Depending on what your project is about, you need people with certain skills. So as an early form of the forming stage, a pre-forming stage, there might be a higher level meeting to start to work out who do we need at this? And what's their skill? What is their abilities that will we can bring to the to the to the team? You don't just put people in there just to build up numbers. You also don't need a huge team. Um we want the right people from different functions. Stay, the, the term used is stakeholders. We want people who have or will have some hand, act, or part in the actual finished product or finished process. They are involved somewhere in it. So therefore, they have what's known as a vested interest. It's in their interest that this happens. They want it to happen. If they have people, if people are bought into the process, they will join the process happily. They will want to be part of the process. And they're the right people to have there. Within reason, because some projects can become very top heavy. Um, we don't, I mean, there's a thing here, there should be a maximum of eight members in the team, in the core team. I actually think that's about two members too much. I don't think you need more than about four or six people in the core team, maybe six in the core team. I think eight is, depending on what it is. Um, if it requires a lot of specialist areas, well, then maybe you need to push it up to eight. But in most cases, I think half a dozen people is maximum you need. Bear in mind that if you put six people, each of them can represent a section, represent a function, represent an area. So they can have their own project team within their function. So I'll go back to the house building. You know, I could have my teams of block layers and electricians and plumbers and plasters and roofers and whatever. But I meet 
the head of those areas, each of the heads of those is the team member in the project, the core project team. But then the electricians will go back to their electrical team and they will deliver, okay, here's what we need to do. They will listen to the team members in their electrical division and report it back to the core team. Speaking with the lads, uh, they don't think we can put the sockets over there because. Or we can put the sockets there if you guys chase the wall to that area. We can get we can put something in there, but it needs to be done first before we do any more. You know, it's teams within a team, but it's a more structured process and it's a clear line of reporting. I'm not saying line of command because it's not command. There's only one command. In the Scrum system, we only take people in as we need them, which I think is the handiest way of doing it. It was one of the biggest issues I find on team issues, team situations, is where a member of the team gets bored because they're sitting there. They have to be on the team, but the team isn't using them and they're not needed for another three months. But they have to be on the team because they're put on the team and they're not allowed to go and do their day job. And they get bored. And by the time their job, the role comes up for them, they've lost all interest. Oh, oh so, so you want me now, do you? All right, yeah. I'll get you when I'm ready. Um, getting the team right and numbers do matter. Having too many means, you know, it's a committee. The more people on the committee, the less decisions are going to be made because the individual politics start to come out. It's harder for project manager to coordinate a team when there's an awful lot of people on the team one it's harder to tie everybody down to a meeting at the right time at the same time and two there's too many other agendas around the place a small tight team is what we need made up of multiple function representation lots of experience and people who have a vested interest in seeing this thing complete. Then we're, we're good to go. But if we don't have that, we have a problem. Just very quickly. Um, the last, just the last couple here. Part of the responsibilities of project manager again this is where we need to be separate from the actual day-to-day -day operations is the development of our team teams are an operation an opportunity for learning as well as we need to have this team because we have to finish get a task completed we develop interpersonal skills because we have to work in a group we have to lose the rank and the positioning we have within the company and now we're part of this group working towards a common purpose, a common goal. So there's training involved. We have maybe to set up team building situations. Maybe in some teams, a, a project manager might need to take a team and do some sort of a team building exercise, go do some carting or some clay pigeon shooting or something paintballing or something to kind of build a team spirit and get a bit of uniformity within a team get a bit of collaboration or, you know, connection within the team, a um, bit of socialising to build the team. We need to set ground rules. This happens back at the very start. The ground rules of what is it we're going to accept or not accept. The usual things like respect. Like if you have the job, if you have a job to do, you do it. Stop grumbling, get on with it. If you have an issue, go to the team lead, go to the project manager immediately. No, you know, behind the behind the, the, the bicycle sheds, rumblings about what that person has said to me or what that person is doing to me. It there's an issue, you go and deal with it. You raise this with the project manager who should always be available for that. And then again, that sort of, any sort of misconduct gets stamped on big time. Don't have time for that. You have, a, you have a tight deadline here. You have a time-based project that needs to be achieved. You don't have time for politics. Sometimes we have to deal with it. There is politics, whether we like it or not, but, you know, it has to be managed. 
some sort of recognition reward is good at the end of the process. Um, but that depends on the project. The last one I want to give you today is just, I suppose, a summary of what is a team, a project team or any team. And what the, the definitions here is that's a group of people with complementary skills committed to a common purpose, a common project, agreed performance goals, a common approach using, for example, recognized methodologies. PM Bach is the project management book of knowledge. Um, or a commitment to see a project through to success, just a commitment to see this, this thing to work, this thing working. And after that, you know, I'm back to, I'm back to normal day-to-day -day stuff. Projects are great opportunities. They are needed in our businesses. They're needed in our worlds. We do it anyway. But we need to have the right approach. We need to have the right people. And they need to have the right mindset. The project manager needs to be able to step back and coordinate. That's what I've got for you. One minute to spare. Well, terrible timing. If anybody has any questions, please. I don't. I have had the chat box open here, and I haven't seen any except one person looking to be put on the the. Didn't get the invitation, so I'll just we can check that again and get that sorted out for the scrum. Uh, anybody, any questions, thoughts, comments, please do. If there is nothing, well, then you may go to your lunch. If you, this was your lunch, well, then you may go back to work. And I shall talk to you next week. Have a good week. Stay safe and so on. No questions. So thanks, everyone. And like that, enjoy your lunch. And thanks, Dennis, for another excellent session. No problem. Thanks, Anya. <laughs> and we'll see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care.